This episode of the MJ Cast is brought to you by MJ Giving Tree. MJ Giving Tree is an authentic jewellery boutique that handcrafts exquisite recreations of items Michael Jackson himself wore. To experience the love and magic imbued in all of their products, visit mjgivingtree.com. The following is a presentation from the MJ Cast, the internet's premier podcast on all things Michael Jackson. I'm a black American. I am proud of who I am. Together, we can make a change in the world. I want to see you! <laughs> I like to take sounds and put them on the microscope. If there's a driving bass, we become the bass. Let the music write itself. I don't sing it if I don't mean it. <laughs> Welcome to the MJ Cast, your source of news, discussion, and interviews on the King of Pop. Hello and welcome to episode 133 of the MJ Cast, our 2021 Vindication Day special. I'm Charles Thompson and I'm on the line with Jamin Ball, the uh, MJ Cast founder. Hi Jamin, how are you doing? I'm great. It's an early morning for me, but very excited to be here. How are you? I'm very well and we're joined on the call as well by the one and only Miss Carol Lemaire who was Michael's hairstylist for some time and was 3T's hairstylist and was also a, a pivotal figure in the uh, the 2005 trial, even though she never made it onto the witness stand. How are you doing, Carol? I'm doing great. Fabulous. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you. And Carol, where are you uh, calling in from? Uh, California, from Culver City, California. Great. When we When we do these kind of episodes, we like to start kind of way back at, at people's origins. And and uh, Charles has explained to me that you've been involved in the fashion and, and beauty industry for, for quite some time working with the Jackson family. How did you originally get into that industry? Well, with Michael, because I was in it already, I met Michael when he got burned. He had hired two different women, and one was more interested in being a dancer, and the other one, he said, wasn't cute. <laughs> So when he um, got a hold of me, it was really funny because I went to Havenhurst. And when he always stayed at the back of the house where you went up these stairs. I don't know if either of you have ever been to Havenhurst. And when I knocked on the door when he was told I was there, he slammed it in my face and asked me if I could go back down and wait by the car. So while I was waiting by the car, I see my, um, Michael. And it was like the Pink Panther. He was sneaking behind bushes to get into the house, the main house, to change because he had like a shower cap on. And I guess he didn't want me to see him like that. I guess he thought I was going to be really ugly or something. I don't know what it was. (laughs) So when he tiptoed back to the spot, then he had them call me and tell me to come up, which it was just funny to me. Do you know how he came to find you and, and to hire you. What what brought you to his attention? Janet said to him, because she did Janet Jackson's hair, she would style it, because I only do certain things. So she had told him about me, because I, I can do hair pieces, and a lot of people say I'm the best in the world. I don't, I don't know if I am. So that's how I met him. I didn't meet him to care and say. So take us, take us back to... Um... Havenhurst, so you get invited up, and and then what happens? Oh, we talked, and um, he was real shy at first, because he liked my hair, because uh, I'm Native American and Russian, and he liked my hair, because I have dark, black, long hair, and I'm pale. So he he was just blown away with my hair. It was just funny how he just kept talking about my hair. And we just got to talking, and I seen what the problem was, where he got burned and told him what I could do. And from then, I started working with him. I got rid of different people because I don't really care who somebody is. I'm not going to let anybody overcharge them. And as time progressed, I felt they were overcharging him for the product that I was putting on him. So he essentially needed somebody with your um, speciality and expertise because of the burn. because he got burned. When he got burned, it took, you know, it burned his scalp, but all of a sudden every doctor knew how to fix it, and they didn't fix it like they should, it just kept causing it to get bigger and bigger, because I remember 
when he, he had a hideout on Wilshire. And I remember when I went there, I came in and I mean, I was almost on the floor crying laughing because they had did something they called the flap and they blew his scalp up and he looked like a, a Martian. But he was laughing right with me, so. But numerous people tried to do things that, instead of having somebody that specialized, it was like people were coming forward claiming they could fix that. Right. And that particular method is similar to when somebody takes leather and an animal and they tan the hide and stretch it. Similar to the same theory, but it didn't really get a chance to work because he had to go back out on the road. And doctors had to tell me how to take care of it, you know, because I would go out for a minute with him. So it never, he never really got a chance for it to heal. That's how record companies are. And, and so what was necessary for Michael in terms of you working with his hair? Would you, during the times you worked with him, did you have to use a particular kind of hair piece or what, what was the situation there? I had, I had pieces made and... He st- he had he still had hair and stuff like that, but I had pieces made and I I would attach them, but I also taught him how to tear of it, you know how to work with the front, because sometimes when people use clips, you just pull more hair out. So I taught him a lot, just different things he could do. He was very smart there, and there were mm-hmm. times when, if you notice, he wanted a curl in the front, I would put a curl in front. I would just sprayed it so far and then let this curl hang. So I was brought in more when all that happened to his head. And I remained up until maybe two months before he passed away. We're looking forward to talking with you about your journey with him. Um, Just in those early days, did Michael ever express to you how he felt about what happened to him with the burn and how that left him? No, he would laugh about it. He would show me the video over and over where it started to burn when it said cotton fire. It was funny to him. That's what was great about Michael is he would take things in a different stride than a lot of people. There's a lot of things people don't even really realize about him. I mean, he had a laugh that was, it was magical, his laugh. Anybody that was around him will tell you that. He had this magical laugh. When you say that people were coming in and telling him that they could fix it and they were making it worse, are you talking about... I'm talking about plastic surgeons, doctors that said they could fix the burn. They could get it to where he wouldn't have to wear nothing, but that never happened. He went to, I think, maybe three different surgeries, and it just finally was like, let's stop. This ain't going to happen. I mean, it would get infected, and it wasn't that big at first. Okay, so it was, in fact, the efforts to fix it just made things worse and worse. But when you say it was getting worse, what do you mean? Do you mean that he was losing more and more hair? What do you mean when you say it was getting no, worse? No, no. With the burn, where the burn was, they said, that, like the one I told you about where they blew his head up, it was like he was a Martian when I walked in because they stretched his scalp so they could stitch it back together. But that didn't work because he had to go back out on the road and then it just gets infected because I didn't stay out on the road with him. So, it, you yeah. know, it just it got bigger and bigger where he was burned, where he lost more hair. And that, but he was okay with it. You know, he learned, he dealt with it. That's just Michael. Right. And so this was around the time, I guess, when you say he went back on the road, I'm assuming you're talking about the Jackson's victory tour? On tour. No, not by then. I don't think he wasn't with the Jackson. Oh, so yeah, the the balloon procedure was before the dangerous tour, I think. And that's when he started. That's where uh, we'll come to this later. But I think that's when he was prescribed the pain meds and it all went a bit south. I don't, I don't think the pain meds at that time was that bad. I don't think that had a lot to do with the pain pills. I really don't. It was other stuff later on down the road. We'll uh, come to that in a while. Can you tell us a bit about how your relationship developed? So from the first time you meet him, as you say, you end up as a part of his team for a long time. So how did you bond? And I was the person nobody knew about. Like when we went, if I went somewhere with him, I didn't stay with anybody else. I stayed wherever he was. The only people that really knew me were the guards. And there was a person that worked with him. She seemed to have jealousy problems, but she didn't stay where I stayed. 
So I became close to him in that way because he could confide things into me, you know, tell me how he felt about stuff. And Can know, I just clarify the person you're talking about? I don't I'm sure other people have given you her name. Uh, if, well, if you're talking about uh, Karen Faye, we've, we've heard yeah. similar stories from many, many people. She was a <laughs> very big problem for me. She, she did things that weren't nice. And to this day, she still does stuff. Like what? Oh, like if, if Percy would have her book me a hotel, she put me in some hotel where that wasn't even finished. And just things she would do. She would make up stories about me. And as we go further, I can tell you a little bit about stuff she did because it got to a point I quit. And I told him why. I said, if you want to know something about me, then I'm sorry, you have to ask me. You can't go by what someone else says because that isn't how life works. You have to judge me by me. And that that changed a big part of my life with him. I mean, even the three T never knew what I did with them. And I found that out maybe a couple months ago. One of them asked me. (laughs) Because I never discussed it with anybody. I never talked to the press. So you're um, you're talking about being in hotels and uh, with Michael and that sort of thing. So yeah, it um, got to where I didn't talk to people that were on the road. Everything I did was strictly with him. If he didn't hop on a plane to get to another country and he wanted to drive, I had to. I drove with. I didn't get on the plane with other people. So how did you get to a point where you were? traveling with Michael. So you're brought in to cover over the burn and figure out a remedy for that problem. But how did you become a part of the entourage? Because there were things I could do that, you know, Karen thought she could do with the hair. And I can even look at stuff and tell you where my work is and where hers is. And I could do things that she couldn't do. Like I, when he wanted longer hair, I would add and make my own extensions on his head. Just a lot of things I could do. That, and I think he just enjoyed me. Because I, I'm just a different person. I'm not hung up on who somebody is. If I like you, I like you. And I just think that was a lot of why he... Even Carrie Anderson talks about how excited he'd get whenever I was coming somewhere. But that's further down. But I just think he liked me. And I think sometimes people get jealous. Never had trouble with the bodyguards. Never. Or the cooks at the time when Sudna was out on the road with them. Yeah, we, we've actually spoken to Kerry Anderson. He was the very first interview that we ever did around Michael Jackson, I think maybe, geez, six years ago at this point or seven years ago. Wonderful, wonderful guy. Now, I, I'd like to talk about your first involvement with Michael Jackson on a professional artistic level, or in terms of his art at least. So was that would that have been the black or white shoot or were you working with him? The black and white was the first one where I – worked on a video with him. And the funny thing is, he kept me there the whole time. Even though he didn't need me there, he still kept me there. He wanted me there. And that was a long shoot. I think that was, what, 30 days? Yeah, and things kept... We've, we've spoken to uh, the choreographer and different people on that shoot who describe it as quite a uh, uh, chaotic kind of shoot because the vision for the video was changing throughout the process. Now, was that the one we did? No, the one we did with Singleton was... Was that the one with Singleton? Uh, no, I believe John Singleton was uh, Remember the Time. Yeah, okay. John Landis was uh, Black or White. That's right. It was Landis. I really liked him. See, I didn't what even was... talk to him. Like, you'll never see me in pictures. You'll see me in a picture that, a couple of pictures that he wanted taken on a shoot when we were in the desert, and that's it. I always stayed hidden because I was very well known. Yeah, yeah. And talk to us about your memories um, on the black or white shoot in particular. Oh, you mean the fun stuff? Yeah. We, me and him did that got people mad. <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, Michael had a habit of doing little ignorant stuff. So Michael would do things like, say I was in the dressing room with him. He put toilet paper in the back of my pants, which <laughs> I didn't know was there. And I stepped out, out, out with the toilet paper. Janet Satoon would wear real short dresses. He tucked her dress into her G string. <laughs> he just thought he was funny, so I go, you know what, I'm gonna get him for this. I snuck into his dressing room and I found his um little white underwear and I smeared chocolate because I knew he was gonna have a meeting. And it was really funny because he told me 
he noticed him sitting there when the people came in and he was trying to slide them. <laughs> but, you know, just things like that. I had fun with him. Sometimes people get mad at the jokes, but <laughs> that was my, me and his thing. Just different things we did to help on. I mean, when, I, I could imagine him trying to slide those underwear out of the way. <laughs> when you say uh, people got mad, was that because it disrupted the shooting schedule? No, it was people like Karen, you know. Why would she get mad at the at the jokes? Because she's a very insecure person. Very, very insecure. I could tell you things we worked on, and I just think she hated that I was there. And but I'm sure like, she was that way with a lot of people. What was it like for you to be seeing Michael Jackson at work for the first time? Um, I enjoyed watching him. You know how hard he worked and how seriously he took it. Had you traveled with him before you started working on the video shoots? I might have went to doctors with him and different things. But not on And tour. went to his hideouts a lot. No, that was when I... That was the first one I started on was black and white. So you do black or white, and then you've mentioned Remember the Time. So what are your memories from the John Singleton Remember the Time shoot? Well, my memories were there. I had been talking to him, and I said, you've got to check out this director, which was Singleton. I said, and I told him to check out Boys in the Hood. I said, I think you should check him out. And it was funny. I didn't think he paid attention. He did. And next thing I knew, he was directing. I think I just enjoyed it. It was it was fun. I think one of the funnest times was when Iman and Eddie Murphy were sitting on thrones. And there was an eagle. And it was just hilarious because the eagle started flapping its wings. And Eddie went running off that stage running down <laughs> and he stopped and he looked at everybody and Eddie said where I'm from you hear something flap and you run because <laughs> he was Marla saying like he's from the hood or somewhere Iman just sat there very elegant she didn't move or nothing <laughs> which was kind of cool just to watch the two reactions of them and that so that, that that was a lot of fun just different things you know that we did and it was always jokes, like Michael would tell me to go put stink bombs in, in the um, director's trailers or stuff, just ignorant stuff he'd ask me to do. And then sometimes other people that worked with them would get mad. Um, I've got a question about Remember the Time and just hair, in J Michael's hair in, in that particular video. Uh, please, you know, uh, ignore my um, lack of education around hairstyling here. But Michael's hair in that uh, video looks different to really any other video in that it's very soft and long. Is that, is his hair in that video that, is that a wig or is that, did you do something else with no, his hair? No, it wasn't a wig. It was a small hair piece on top and I did extensions. Right. Okay. Like the curl you would see, I would always throw that in somewhere. I don't know if we had a curl on that one. And, and just on that note, because I've always wondered this, I mean, I guess it's out of chronological order here, but I'll ask anyway. Later on in Michael's life, you know, starting with really around the, the very early 2000s and onwards during the trial period, Michael pretty much exclusively wore uh, long, straight wigs, really for the last decade they of his life. They weren't wigs. They weren't wigs. Oh, okay. Well, I did that. Okay. Can you talk to us about that? They were a, a hairpiece. I did a hair piece and I would put extensions and I would, sometimes we wanted curly hair. I mean, I can talk now because of all this came out in the open. Otherwise I wouldn't talk. Um, they were always extensions in a hair piece. I never put wigs on them. Never. Never. He okay. Had so hair. What, can, I, I don't understand this, but what is the difference between a hair piece and a wig? A hair piece is something that you, a man can wear on top. And then you could put extensions on the bottom instead of putting a whole hair piece on them. Uh huh. Okay. So it makes yeah. a, man, a person more comfortable because it's like it's their hair. Right. You know, it's different when you put them in a full wig. It's like they don't feel the same. Right. Right. Now our audience and, is and probably. And he did have hair. So we we know that um you know for, as you say it became a matter of public record because of the manner in which Michael passed away and um he See, had I to wasn't have a... doing him then and I know okay. things probably changed. But um 
in the autopsy report, it basically said that he only had hair on the back half of his crown, and he'd had the front half of his hair, uh, his head tattooed. Was that something that had happened by the time you finished working with him, or did that happen after? You know what? When I used to do them, I maybe his eyebrows were tattooed, but I would use a marker sometimes to fill something in. You know, I did things totally different than this person that came in after. Mm -hmm. Okay. He didn't, if a hairpiece is covering your top, there's no reason why you have to be tattooed. But there are products out there, which I'm sure was used after, because I've heard he was totally bald on top after. And if he was, they used this product on him. And it probably killed his hair follicles, because I've had this happen to my own other clients, which makes me furious when people do something like that, because he did have hair. We've um, we've sort of jumped out of chronological order, so I'm just going to try and drag us back to where we were. But you were talking about Michael's sort of penchant for practical jokes, and I know that when I was out with you and Taj a couple of years ago, you were saying that he was at his worst practical joke-wise when he got together with David Guest. So oh, they were horrible. <laughs> where did you encounter them together, and what did they do? They woke me up one night, and Michael, it was like real late at night, and Michael said, I need you to come over. I go, but I'm sleeping. He said, but please. I said, okay. So I get in my car, I go over there, and he has David pretending he's this French director, and they really want to use me in this movie, and they start playing this little game. And I played along with it, but, but you know, I know Michael. And I very seldom ever got mad at him. I mean, he woke me up out of my sleep, and they just thought they were so funny. They just went on and on with this joke <laughs> and that. And they were very close, very close. When I think was that was this? probably when... one of his closest friends. And what, what kind I of other stuff? No, they, they thought they were so funny. Just things he would do to other people. You know, there was times we got in his Bronco. He had this big Bronco, and we'd drive around and throw eggs at people. <laughs> or we would crane call people. We had to quit doing that, though, because remember when all of a sudden they could see your number? <laughs> we we called um, his Hoffman. That was a plastic surgeon. And Janet Zitun was in on that one. And we, we were saying stuff to him. But one time he called me, he had me call some church women. And it was hilarious because he was cussing at them. <laughs> and I mean, it's funny to me at the time, maybe it isn't to other people, but it was just funny things he would do. Like one time my sister moved out here and she really needed a job. And I was telling him and I said, she's hoping she gets a second interview. He said, let's call her and pretend I'm calling her back on this second interview. So we call her and he tells her he wants her to come in for a second interview. But then he tells her, but I don't want you to wear panties. <laughs> <laughs> now, my sister's very, very conservative. So I could just imagine her face at the time. And, you know, she was cool about it, though. But he just went on. And, I mean, she took it very serious. I, we, I told her after that it was a, that what we did. But, I mean, it was fun. <laughs> I mean, just a lot of things we did to people, crank calls. We'd, we'd just call people and do things. I mean, it was a practical joker. Anybody that was around him close would tell you things he liked to do. What was the um, the prank on Hofflin? What did you do to Dr. Hofflin? We had, I think it was Janet, call him and pretend that he did a breast implant. And one boob was pointing to the right and the other to the left. <laughs> and she went on and on, but he caught on to it. I'm trying to think what his nickname was with Hofflin. Hofflin had a nickname for Michael. And I can't remember what it was. And he knew it was Michael. He caught on to it. Did you spend a lot of time with Hofflin or around him? Or did you know him well? No, I, I would sometimes drive him places. I know him and Arnie, though, would, would be jealous of each other. And Hofflin would call me all upset and wanting to know what Arnie was doing and vice versa. It was just funny with the two of them. I think you told me that Michael, even one year for Christmas or something, bought all of the staff vouchers for plastic surgery. Is that right? Oh, yeah, but I didn't take it. I didn't. Karen did, and I think others, but 
I, I took a piece of art. I said, no, because I know you'll be hiding in there and you'll see me naked. And <laughs> who's to say what you would do? Because, <laughs> you know, there's things I can't talk about. I'm sure you've heard, but I can't. Uh, so, I mean, it's quite an unusual gift, though. Was that a kind of a tongue-in-cheek gift, or what What was going That It just seems like an unusual Oh, well, I think with see. Karen, he always made fun of her chin. You know, she had that big double chin. It was a gift. I just know Michael. I know things that he did, and I'm sure if you've talked to some people that were doctors or something, they laugh about it, because I've heard it has been said, but there's, Michael was funny. He might have been in that surgery room to be, let's put it bluntly, he was probably in the surgery room. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? So, I mean... I mean, Michael you know. was a practical joker. There might be people running around and not even know that their initials, or his initials are sitting inside them somewhere. <laughs> Michael just was a fun person. A fun and a generous person. You know, Michael was obviously very reticent to talk about his plastic surgery for, for many years. But, it seemed, you know, we now pretty much know that, that he was getting quite a lot done as much as he was denying it. And there I didn't has been know a... about that. Being with him, I didn't see him do a bunch of surgeries. I think maybe they got carried away with his nose. But... Well, you're, you're saying that Hofflin and, and Klein were jealous of what each other were doing. So it well, like Arne and they... Klein, Michael had... Um... I can't say, ver I have trouble pronouncing a lot of words, vergotite, where their skin starts turning white in different areas. Oh, vitiligo. Yeah. And that's why, that's why Arnie Klein was around, because there were things they could do, especially if you had money, where they could bleach it. Otherwise, with that particular disease, you walk around and you got dark skin and light skin. So the best way to get rid of that is to bleach the skin up. And Michael could afford that. But to me, I didn't look at that as plastic surgery. I look at that as something because he was an entertainer that could not show that because he definitely had that because I've seen him with his shirt off at times in that. But people look at that as plastic surgery. I don't understand that. But I never seen him do a bunch of plastic surgery, only trying to fix when he got burned. Oh, so that's why he was going to Hofflin fairly regularly was about the... Uh the scalp yes with the scalp and that and i think um hoffman probably did the nose but hoffman should have stopped that's what you're a doctor for you know mm. we all look in the mirror and see things that are different that we think we can change and it's up to a doctor to say no michael was quite often seen with tape on his nose really all through his career at different points are you able to explain why? That's one of the mysteries in the fan community. No, I, I can't do that. I, I can't explain that. I won't do that. Let's leave that one a mystery. Too many things people say about him. And We've, anybody um, that's worked with him will tell you he was probably one of the nicest people. I mean, there's things about him people didn't even know. Like, I was telling him about this homeless family I would see when I was coming up to Fairfax. And he told me to go find them. He wanted to help him out. He never called the press to tell him what he did. I can remember when there was a shooting in Watts and they shot into the wrong house and these people lost their son. And he went, asked me to do whatever we could, got people. And he helped that family. He moved them out of there, got them jobs and that. And he, there were things that he's done that he never talked about. He didn't look for press for helping people. He helped me once with my daughter who, who was sick. Can you tell us that story or is it too personal? With my daughter, it is. But with the little kid, that was pretty sad when he heard about that. Things like that really, really bothered him. He helped a lot of people. Like, I don't understand this kid, Wade, because I know how nice he was to Wade. I don't know why Wade makes up these terrible stories. Yeah, and, and we'll definitely get to that shortly. Yeah. Um, I think before we start getting into the discussion around the allegations in the trial, I really want to round out um, our discussion around your professional involvement with Michael. So we had the black or white shoot. We had Remember the Time. You also mentioned being in the desert. I'm guessing that's for In the Closet. In the Closet. I did a Pepsi one with them. Okay. Oh, yeah, right. Okay. It was like a commercial, like a windstorm. It was a commercial because um, we used Wade. Wade was the kid dancing. 
because he could dance like Michael. I mean, there's ways to change it where it looked like it was Michael's little kid, but it was Wade and that, and that, that was fun. That was fun. I'm sorry. So which, which commercial are we talking about there? If there's a kid in it? There was one we did with Wade. It didn't come to this country. I think it went to Asia or somewhere. And he's dancing. He's Michael dancing. Uh-huh. Right. In a, and that was Wade because I remember when Wade first came, I was at the ranch at the time. He came. He had a sister and the father and the mother because the father ended up not staying in that. So I, I remember all that. And Wade was an excellent dancer. If anybody could dance like Michael, he could. Definitely. You just mentioned being at Neverland. When did you first visit Neverland? I started visiting there from the time he got the ranch. He actually worked on that with Paul McCartney. That's why I seen recently where they said he built the house. No, he had did a video with Paul McCartney, and he fell in love with that. At least that's what he told me, and he bought the place, and that's when he put. The, the rides there and the animals and he did all that stuff. He had planned on building a big pirate ship, but then that, that goes in further ahead too when things started happening. He was going to build this big ship for underprivileged kids to come out and camp and that. I used to bring kids, rent a bus and bring kids up, but I would bring them from different walks of life. I didn't just bring kids that didn't have money, but it was kind of fun with the kids because they would tell me they didn't have any money, so they didn't think they could have any candy. <laughs> I go, no, you can have some candy. And at, at that time, he would always give gifts. Like, they would all get a Neverland shirt and a bag of goodies. But the cutest thing is when they got ready to leave, they would try to empty out everything because it would just go to waste. And I would see kids stick ice cream bars in their pockets, not realizing they're just going to melt. But that that was one of my favorite things, was going to the ranch. And I continued to go there for years. So you watched it um, evolve, really, from when he first bought it, as he kept adding... Have you been to it? No, sadly. Well, it was amazing, because him and... um, What is his name? Macaulay Cawkin? They designed this water fight thing. And it was amazing how the two of them designed that. And there's great stories around that. When I would bring up people with busloads, I would bring chaperones. And I brought these two guys. One was my nephew, and they were all dressed in their white. And they got in that water fight. But see, in that water fight, that fort, there were guns that were the same power of what a fireman has when they hit people with it. (laughs) So those two guys grabbed those from the kids. Now, the kids that were up in there, had water balloons they could throw and just different things. So they didn't know these two guys that there's a button you could push where it would just load like buckets of water on them. And I let them think it was fun at first. And then I said, push the button. (laughs) (laughs) If you could have seen these guys and nine times out of 10, Michael was there, but he would be in disguise where people didn't know it. And he just thought that was so funny. So funny. There's just lots of things that were fun. Oh, yeah, there was times when I had kids up there, he would be in a disguise. They didn't know it was him. Wow. Now, it's like one time we were in the four-wheelers, because I'm like a big old kid when we were there, and I'd drive those things and race. I remember one time I got on one, and I didn't know that mice can get in them, and I'm scared of a mouse. <laughs> and I freaked out and jumped off of it, and the thing's still moving. The guards were all laughing at me. But then they told me, Carol, they go, you're scared of mice, but you run to those fields. There's hundreds and hundreds of mice in those fields, which there was. There were a lot of things I had fun with at the ranch. I had a lot of fun. One time, though, he scared me. I stayed in the part where Elizabeth Taylor liked to stay. They had like three little cabins in it. And he told me the story about this statue. And I, and I guess I was, you know, I was supposed to tell the story to the kids that it was really a spirit in there that this kid had died way before he was there. And that night I'm with all the kids. I'm the one that got scared. (laughs) I couldn't sleep. I was so scared of that ghost. I was definitely frightened. 
because there was times I would stay in the house. I don't know if you ever knew anything about the house, but there were different rooms. Like there was a room that had all these different dolls and there was a room mm. with soldier stuff. And it was just great. I remember once I was sleeping and I could feel somebody staring and I turned and Michael was sitting in a chair and I said, what are you doing in here? He said, I'm looking at your hair. <laughs> I wish I could have your hair. <laughs> Because I did. I had beautiful long black hair. He always liked my hair. There's just a lot of fun things at the ranch I used to have fun with. Like one time when Prince was real little, I said to Prince, where's Paris? Here, I'll show you. And he took me around this little wall thing and showed me these cameras where Paris was. And Michael came and he said, what are you doing, Prince? But I, I used to have so much fun up there. It was so much fun just watching Michael be a big kid because, you know, he would tell me how he never got to be a kid. And I think that's where people confuse him. He was a shrewd businessman, but he enjoyed life of things he missed in life. Yeah. Loved playing jokes. Is that something that you realized about him quite quickly? Yeah, I would bring my kid with me from the time he was a baby. And he was just, he was just such a great man. He got a kick out of kids hitting each other. And I didn't think that was funny <laughs> when he seen Clay, Clay, my son, slap Mason, my other, my grandson. He thought, I said, what's so funny about that? He always liked the kid that would do mean things to other kids. He would just think that was so funny, you know, and I'd have to get on him about that. Because sometimes you'd get a group of kids that were mean. They were bullies. So how old was um, Quay when you first met Michael? Clay was just a baby. Uh, okay. He was just okay. a baby when he when we first met Michael. He would throw Clay a birthday party every year. He would throw him this amazing birthday party at the ranch. Wow. And then Sky, she all of a sudden I had Sky, my granddaughter, and we'd throw a party with the two of them together. But he knew Sky could sing because when he got to one house. She would sing for him. She would sing gospel songs as a little tiny kid. And he would take her into, take her away from everybody. They didn't know it was him. And they'd go into this one place he had up by the theater where it was like a studio where he would dance and had recording stuff and that. And he would talk to her how she had to sing and to practice and practice. And he would talk to her about her voice. because She does have a beautiful voice. She really enjoyed that with him. But his birthday parties, he would give Nico. I remember when Nico got a little older and the, he went to a school where all the kids were Jewish and they were having their bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs. So when he had his party, I rented two buses and I took the kids up there for Michael's. We threw it there. And that's all they talked about. They were just, it was magical to them. Just magical. Because it, it was like that. It was like when you stepped on that property, it was like magic. Sorry, Carol, who is, um, who is Nico? Nico's my son. I call him Quay and I call him Nico. Uh, oh, okay. All right. Okay. He's the same person, but it was just very magical. I, too bad. I don't know if you ever got to, It was just amazing. There was times we'd get up in the middle of the night and go up to where the elephants were. And there was a parrot somebody gave him from a bar. And that parrot would cuss. <laughs> and Michael just thought that was so funny. But that parrot would imitate the mice that hung out where the elephants, where the elephant was. That parrot could make the sounds of a mouse. Hmm. That was another thing, to see his animals when you came up at night, because he had these little houses, and they would be peeking out. And that it was just amazing. It was amazing what he did, like with the snakes, you could push a button where the rattlers were and you could hear their rattles. It was, I'm telling you, it was magical. I remember one of the apes, I, I can't think of his name, when he was a baby, he stayed in the room with me sometimes. Hmm. But as they got older, he couldn't keep them because they become kind of violent. Well, it's, when, it, when you say it stayed in your room? Oh, I bought the, the big chimpanzee. He was a baby in my room. He t stayed in there and slept for a while. What was that in one of the guest units? Uh, no, I stayed in the house. I would stay in the house or stay in a guest unit. Wow. Was this early on in the life of the ranch? I've never heard of guests having rooms in the house before. That's that's really interesting. Oh, no. He would let me stay in the house. 
until I found out he had cameras. <laughs> <laughs> I teased him. I go, you've been looking at me in the shower, haven't you? And he said, no, no, you know. I, I would even answer the phone cause for him at times because I could do his voice to perfection. <laughs> I could talk just like him at one time. And, and I would tease him, yeah, you've been looking at me in those cameras. <laughs> But it, I didn't stay in there a lot. I could if I wanted to. It just, I really got along with them. I wasn't, I was different, I think, than other people because I didn't really hang around the crew because I wasn't allowed to. So none of them really knew of me. Why were you not allowed to? Because of what I do for a living. And I was very well known. Oh, I see. So was Michael quite sensitive about people finding out? Very sensitive. It wasn't. Very sensitive to 3T, never knew what I did. Yeah, I see. Very sensitive. I mean, it was nobody's business. I never talked to the press. I always stayed out of the way if there were cameras around or press, I would stay away. So um, how much, you know, by this point, you know, where you're going to Neverland and you're on the video shoots, how big a oh, part I started going to. I started going to, I went to D.C. with them. When he was gone to be with, I think it was Clinton. And, and I remember I went out and I was supposed to go with him. And I was out dancing all night. Instead. <laughs> I could tell you great stories how I got left somewhere once. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you get left? Remember Ryan White? We were traveling at the same time when we went to Clinton's. From there, Trump sent his plane to come and get us because he wanted us to be at the opening of his casino and he was paying i'm sure he paid my, michael a lot of money for that so when we got to the casino it wasn't really finished but trump was already having people come in there and i remember we were walking in i always remember this little old lady and she had her money sitting in her little like cane they carried and everybody's walking and pushing her and she's like her little voice going she said, what's going on why are you all doing this? And I never knew that Michael noticed that too, but he did. <laughs> <laughs> so that night, I went to my room to go to sleep. And Michael, everybody went to the rooms, but Ryan passed away. They couldn't get me up. Nobody could wake me up. So I got left there. I had to fly back to New York in one of those propeller planes. I was sick as hell <laughs> because of the smell of it. Because they had to leave me. What what did Michael rush to? Um, he went to. He Ryan's went mother. rushed to Brian White. Yes, yes, he did. He was very upset over that. Very upset. Did you meet Ryan? I had seen him at the ranch, but I never really talked to him. Hmm. I didn't talk to a lot of people because that was, you know, just me. So it sounds like you were very much a part of Michael's existence at this time. So had you? basically become full-time or were you still juggling michael with other clients i i couldn't do full-time because i i couldn't stay out on the road all the time because i had other clients and a lot of my other famous clients i basically had to give up because they were demanding so it was take a choice because i've worked with janet too and latoya and reby and randy and 3t yes i i actually worked i did all the work on them I even learned to barber, and I look at my work now and say, wow, <laughs> that was pretty good with those fades. I cut um, Carol's hair, and then I put a little bit of color to bring his hair up to like a blonde so they could all look different. And TJ, I just shaved him a little and left it. I really enjoyed them. They have a video where I worked with them a behind the scenes, and it's hilarious because of things they're saying to me. Is that Carol Lemire? <laughs> <laughs> I used to have fun with them because they were very young, very young. I even remember when their mother passed away and I got called and it was so upsetting for them. Mm. I went to go to the funeral and I got as far as there. And when I seen them bring in Carol and I said, I'm leaving. I didn't stay. I couldn't stand to see Carol how upset he was because they were just kids. Mm. How? Who called you to tell you that had happened? I think one of the boys did. I'm oh. pretty sure it was one of the boys that called me. I was pretty close to the three T, especially Taj. Yeah, well, I know, I know Taj. You know, 
to you, you're very special to Taj. I know that. Yeah, they were special to me. I was around um, just all different things they've went through. And I know Michael loved those three boys, especially Taj. All right, Charlie and Carol, let's take a break to talk about our first sponsor of this episode, MJ Giving Tree. In 2017, MJ Giving Tree first started as a fan page on Instagram that researched facts about Michael Jackson. After two years, the popular account experienced a pivotal day that involved Michael's daughter, Paris, and it was then that the account grew into something much, much more. We'll get into that soon, but first, let's go back even further. When the founder of MJ Giving Tree was a child, she experienced serious health issues. Michael was personally there for her, writing her letters and sending her hope that she'd walk again. MJ Giving Tree has grown into a passion project that is a way of giving back to Michael for saving her while in a dark time of her life. While meeting Michael's daughter Paris in 2019, the owner of MJ Giving Tree told her about the influence Michael had had on her life, and while taking a picture together, Paris showed her Michael's red bracelet that she's now worn for years. The MJ Giving Tree shop was born that day and has grown into a high-quality jewellery boutique that handcrafts exquisite recreations of items Michael Jackson himself wore. Now, two years later, fans around the world wear MJ Giving Tree's exquisite replicas and often say they feel connected to him by wearing them. This month marks the two-year anniversary of when MJ Giving Tree shop began and there are now nearly 10 replica items that MJ Giving Tree makes by hand. What drives MJ Giving Tree is seeing fans around the world feel closer to Michael, closer to each other, and to feel love when they look down at their wrists. She even takes the items to Forest Lawn and Neverland, giving Michael Jackson fans a uniquely magical experience. MJ Giving Tree jewellery is loved within the Michael Jackson fan community and is worn by friend of the show Jonathan Sugarfoot Moffat, has been gifted to TJ Jackson, and even purchased by yours truly at the MJCast. As a special gift to our listeners, enter the code THEMJCAST at checkout at mjgivingtree.com and receive 15% off your order. That's one word, checkout code THEMJCAST for 15% off your order. To mark Vindication Day, I'd suggest getting the Vindication Bracelet by MJ Giving Tree, which is a replica of one of the bracelets Michael wore on June 13th, 2005. Additionally, 10% of all proceeds are donated to Prince Jackson's charity foundation, Heal Los Angeles. MJ Giving Tree continues to create products that honor Michael and his legacy and has unique artwork, subscription boxes, original prints, more replicas, and other great things planned for the future that you won't want to miss. Visit mjgivingtree.com and experience where fans connect. MJ Giving Tree's owner can also be found on MJ Giving Tree and MJ Giving Tree Shop on Instagram. Thank you to MJ Giving Tree for sponsoring this episode of the MJ Cast. So we've sort of gone on a, a detour again, but we were about to talk about about the um, In the Closet video out in the desert with Naomi Campbell, which I think is the only picture I've ever seen of you and Michael together, is of you guys on the, um, the In the Closet shoot. So what are your memories of, of being there? Um, my boyfriend coming with and losing my keys in the desert. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, Naomi Campbell, I didn't recognize her. And, you know, people look different before they're made up. And I said real loud, I said, where is she? First thing on, they go, shh. <laughs> and she was <laughs> sitting there. I remember Michael and her doing the video and then she got nasty with them and he wanted it to end. <laughs> what do you mean? What nasty? Uh, nasty kind of hit on him. Kind of hit on him. Oh, the nasty in that sense. I see. Okay. And that it was a fun video. I I was blown away with the body this woman has, and just the people. Like, um, I think Cindy Crawford showed up there. A lot of different people showed up just to watch the video and that. So what's the deal there? Because you know, most men, if Naomi Campbell came onto them, would probably you know die of enthusiasm. So why why was Michael so freaked out about it? I think because Michael was a bigger star than her. I know the person he always told me he liked was 
God, what was her name? Tatum O'Neill. That's who he always told me he had a crush on. I know he, him and um, Manuel, Emmanuel, they both had a crush on Brooke. I had to tell both of them, forget it. She ain't going to look at you two. <laughs> Why not? Why was she not going to look at... Look oh, at... I, would just, I would just tease them. You know, you tease oh. people. I had a relationship with him where I could just be Carol. And I think that's why I got along with him is because just things, you know, I related to with him and that. But he always told me he liked her. Did you get a lot of downtime with Michael? So I understand you, you were professionally involved with him a lot, but just time where you guys could relax and talk together. Oh, yeah. When I go over there, we would talk for hours. He would tell me about when he was a kid and how they worked at these burlesque places and They'd come home. I'm not going to talk about his dad because it's not right. Mm -hmm. Just different stories he would tell me, you know, that he went through and that. And there was times he'd call me up and I'd go sit with him. There was a time he came to my house in the middle of the night because he he was upset. And he pretended he wanted me to wash his hair, which was bullshit. And we talked and he he said, I'll buy you a Porsche. I I said, you don't got to buy me a Porsche to come over to my house. But. I'll take that red jacket you wear that has the Flintstones on that. <laughs> and I had that jacket, and somebody stole it from me. Mm. So, no, I used to sit up and talk to him. A lot of things we could talk about with both our lives. Like, they, you know what my nickname was? Don't touch me. <laughs> I didn't like people to hug me. So it was always push people away. And he would do this group hug thinking he was funny. <laughs> <laughs> And how I pronounce words. He would make fun of how I say tur. Those things didn't bother me because of just the person he was. He was just so genuine. I remember there was times I'd be putting a relaxer and come back and he'd be putting it, combing it through himself. And I'd tell him, you know, yell at him over that. Because to this day, I have this dryer from the hideout. And I have, I used to have a chair. I gave it away in a sink. And I, we used to have a steamer. I have that still. Those are things, you know, when he moved from there, he told me, go there and get that stuff. Hmm. One of the nicest people you could ever work for. Speaking of these kind of heart-to-heart moments and sort of sad moments, brings us on to the, the issue of the, the Geordie Chandler case, because you told Taj and I about how you had been present for this phone call. Yeah, I was there, and Jordan was crying, saying, why is my dad doing this? And Michael was very upset. I mean, you don't think the kid moved far away from the dad. The dad ended up committing suicide. But when you're famous like him, people are going to do anything to extort money from you. Can you just talk us through that, you know, what was going, where, where were you that day, what was happening? I came point? over to do his hair, and he was very upset because of what was going on. I mean, extremely upset because I think that's when the pills started. Mm-hmm. And I remember he called, and he was crying, the little kid, and telling him, I don't know why they're saying this. He was very upset, very upset, but both of them were. It's uh, so. How had you found out? Because you, you know, you say when you got there, Michael was upset because everything that was going on. So how how had you found out? It was on the news. Okay, so that's important. So that means that this phone call came after. Um, oh yeah, it came when he was. I I believe it was right when it started because he was still at the hideout on Galaxy. If I'm correct, yes, he was. Because then he moved from there. I just know he was extremely, the two of them were upset. And how much of the phone call could you hear? I just heard that and they were crying. Mm. The little boy was crying and that was it. I stepped out because I was in the middle of doing this hair. What was, you know, when you first heard the news of these allegations, how, how you first heard and what your reaction was? That it was a lie. That it was a lie because my son was around him from the time he was a baby and I'd never seen him do anything inappropriate. He always liked the kids that were bad. 
like Macaulay Calkins that get into stuff and like putting water so when people open a door, it's a whole bucket of water falls on their head. <laughs> I just thought it was terrible for people to do that. I mean, celebrities don't have a life. They will make up any story about a celebrity, you know, and they still do it. I and, get in uh, arguments with people. What about Michael? Yes, I was around him a lot. And I tell people, don't listen to the press. If they think something's going to make them bigger, they're going to do whatever they can. Can you um, remember the first time that you saw Michael after you heard that this was happening and how he was doing? I was at, I told you I was at, I was at his house. Oh, so that was the first, that was the first time you'd yeah, seen Yeah, that was right time. when it started happening, and he was very, very upset. Yeah, and um, how close to you, how close were you to him as that situation unfolded? And I'm thinking I particular... never would bring it up to him because I know how sad he was over it. I know how he met the kids because he told me how they were driving and Gary was driving them and the car broke down or the van or whatever they had. And he wanted to go rent a wreck. And I believe the mother's husband, new husband, owned that place. So they went there to rent a wreck. And that's how he met that family because the father wasn't with her. I think he was a dentist or something. Because I remember him yeah. telling me how he met them, met this kid. And Carol, did you see Michael and Jordan Chandler interacting at the ranch? What was their relationship like before? I never met Jordan. I never met Jordan. Okay. Never mm. met him. I don't know if he was at the ranch. Oh, yeah, of course. So this conversation happened at the apartment. Yeah. So, so was this something that Michael sort of studiously avoided talking about? Was this something that you ever had a conversation about? I wouldn't have a conversation with him about it. Just like we never talked about the press and he wouldn't look at magazines even before that because of stories they make up about people. So no, I don't get to discuss that and I would never do that with him. I know how sad he was over it. So after how hard the, it was uh, for him. After that case, did you continue to work with Michael on videos and things like that for the next project. Yes, I continued to work and then Karen would always start up and I would leave for a minute. So we're now at the part of the story where it becomes relevant for you to tell us what the what the deal was with Karen. So what happened that made you quit? Um, he would either fire me or I would quit because she would say things about me. You know, it bothered me because I had all, I quit many times on him over Karen because of stuff she would say. And to me, you judge me for me. Like I would always tell him that don't judge me by what she has to say. I mean, I remember when I first met him, the first thing he did was show me this big mannequin of her and was laughing about it that he had at the place on Havenhurst. But see, these were things nobody said to her, but I don't know what her problem was with me. Maybe because I didn't stay with her. I don't know, or maybe because she couldn't boss me. So when you say because of things she was saying about you, what was she criticizing your work or? No, she just makes up stories. Like there was a guy on the road, his name was David Williams. And I had known him before and she had seen me say hi to him. And that's all. And then I stayed away. I went with the, on the VIP thing and sat with his guests. And uh, she told him I was sitting, hanging out. And I told Michael, no, I've known David for years. But no, I wasn't sitting with him backstage or anything because I didn't stay backstage. There was a lot of things. that There's a lot of jealousy when you work with people on the road. You know, it happens when you're out on the road. There's, especially with him. You run into a lot of jealousy. So it just, she just had problems. It was always something with her. Was he ever apologetic about firing you, or how did that resolve itself? Yes, each time? he would call me and ask me to come back. And I'd tell him, I'm not coming back if she's going to say things about me. But why did he keep listening to her? Why did he keep, why did he keep firing you? Because that was Karen. Karen would act like they were just this special relationship. If she only knew. Which I'm not going to say things, but believe me, there were jokes about her with him. She wasn't a nice person, but he found that out as we go further into this story. So in terms of the history era, after the Geordie Chandler thing, it's, you know, the settlement happens, he revives, he continues with his career. 
do you remember what projects you worked on with him around that time, videos and things like that? I would travel with him. It got where he'd only take me and a bodyguard. And um, with the kids with the nanny, he wouldn't bring Karen or any of them. I would just go on different things he had to do. Like when he went to the Trump thing and the Clintons, and I would just travel with him. He would ask me to come with him. I'd be there to do his hair and stuff, because then I could do the whole thing. Oh, and uh, sorry, you mentioned something a few minutes ago. You said with the uh, the Jordan Chandler situation, you felt that that was when the pills became a problem. Well, I think uh, I think when he got burned, but I think he was so sad that somebody would say that uh, to him about him. I just think he was so innocent with stuff he couldn't understand that. From that point on, was there ever a time again where you felt that the pills were not a problem, or did you feel that they were a consistent problem from then I on? I didn't think they were a real bad problem yet, but it became a thing where when I would do a relaxer, he would want to take a pill. But I don't think it was that bad yet. I think it, it got bad yeah, with the second but with Gavin. So is that painful then, when you have a relaxer, or not? It wasn't a relaxer he took. Oh, no, a relaxer isn't painful. Maybe to some people, but you put a base on them, so. You know, when you get accused of something, people do different things. And back then, you had pharmacies and doctors that would just give anybody anything, and we all know that. I mean, look at Prince and all these people, but now it isn't so easy for people to obtain. Yeah, so that so there was no good reason really why if you're having a relaxer put on your hair you would need to take a pain pill. Well, he might have felt pain because he'd been burned before. I see. But he never used it it was something that he started doing as opposed to being something that he'd always done. I can't really remember. I just okay. remember there was times he would take something. Carol, Michael often talked about having serious problems with sleep and getting to sleep. And, you know, and people have suggested that he took some of the more serious drugs to actually just get to sleep at night. Did he ever talk to you about his problems with sleep? No, I know he couldn't sleep. As we go further, you'll understand more. Mm -hmm. okay, I know when so I started traveling, different things happened in that, but... I, I think when I really started working with him more was with um, the Gavin kid. And every day in my life, I regretted that I listened to somebody when they begged me to introduce them or let them meet him. Because normally I don't do that with anybody. Let's let's talk about that. Can you talk about the, the Arviso relationship with Michael from the very beginning? How did it all start? Well, I met them. My son used to tap dance. And they came to the tap school. And then they did this workshop with um, Brene from The Fresh Prince. And she would come and teach acting and that and got to know them. And I, they befriended me. At that time, I didn't know them that well, but I caught on after because I drove a brand new Lexus and that. And I would talk to the mother and the father and the kids. And then Gavin got cancer. And it was pretty bad. But the thing is, is the mother didn't seem to care. It was the father. And I started finding out different things after I introduced him to Michael, which I regret every day of my life because um, he, the father left the mother because of the stuff she was doing. And he would come over to my house and talk about it. And then the girl moved in with me. She didn't want to stay at the mother's. And I felt bad for her and I let her stay at my house. I gave her a room upstairs and she would tell me horrible stories what her mother would do. And I started worrying about the Michael thing. And all of a sudden I wasn't working with Michael for a minute. One day she, the father, there was this interview with that. What was that guy's name from London? Martin Bashir. His, the father said to me, Carol, they're up to something. They're up to something. Now, just, and I said, what do you mean? He said, my son's going to lay on his shoulder. And that's exactly what he did. He said, my wife's getting ready to play her con games. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, just watch. She's going to go after him for money. Now, they had been coming up to the ranch, and he was nice to them. Now, the girl didn't go because she was always with me. But one day she went to see her mother, and she came back, and she said to me, this was after... 
they started all that stuff when they were starting to start this stuff. And she, they had quit going there. And she had said to me that they were getting a big house in Hollywood Hills. I said, how is your mother buying a house in Hollywood Hills when you get, when they live in a garage? Oh, we're getting, and she went to say something about Michael and she shut up. And I kind of caught on to something to that. And then I think that's when they did the interview. I think that's what it was. Yeah, I've actually got, Carol, because it may refresh your memory, because we're talking about nearly 20 years ago, but I've got in front of me your investigator's statement from the uh, the case. Can I just read you this section about Dave Lynn? Okay. Okay, so it says, In the year 2000, Dave Lynn lived with Lemire because Dave Lynn was not getting along with Janet, who was dating a police officer who was rumoured to be a pedophile. Dave Lynn hated being with Janet. She cried whenever she was on the phone with Janet, Lemire commented. Dave Lynn told Lemire that Janet would wake her up in the middle of the night, would hit her, and demand that she do things like clean the house or run to the store. Dave Lynn also complained to Quay about Janet's abusive behaviour. Lemire noticed that when Dave Lynn came over, she smelled and was not bathing. At the time, Dave Lynn told Lemire that Michael was going to buy her family a big house. After questioning Dave Lynn about what that meant, Lemire figured out that Dave Lynn was implying that Janet was going to blackmail Michael, forcing him to buy the family a house. The plan was to accuse the client of showing the children how to log on to adult websites. Dave Lynn acted as though she did not know how to use the internet until she met the client. Lemire became upset and told Dave Lynn that it was wrong to falsely accuse someone of wrongdoing. Dave Lynn became flustered and scared, and then said that she was joking. Shortly thereafter, Lemire called Evie Tavassi and told her to get Michael away from the Arviso kids. So that's from um, the investigator's report. I just remember her telling me how she would beat them with anger and how she'd make them go in stores and steal and how she lied something with pennies where she got a bunch of money. She made up some story and won all this money and just the con games she was teaching them. And Gavlin was, Gavlin was staying with me because she didn't want to be around it and she loved her dad. She would tell me how she'd try to run the dad over and stuff. So I became, I let her come stay with me and I liked the little chubby boy star. That's why I was shocked when he came became part of this vicious thing they did. Because Dallin ended up moving back with her mother. I called Abby and told her to keep them away from him. One day I get a call and they ask me, do I know where they're at? And I said, no. Now, I talked to Gary as a friend, the driver. He used to be Michael's driver. And I told him, and he went right away and told them. That was, that's when I knew things were going to hit, hit, because then they had the, that interview where the boy all of a sudden was laying on Michael's shoulder and stuff, and that, it just became a mess. The oh, yeah, father wanna... would cry about it. He knew everything they were going to do. I just want to jump back a bit, because when you said about that David said to you, Gavin's going to lay his head on Michael's shoulder, I think when, I think when I was out with you and Taj, you said that you actually had sat that at the moment he made that comment to you, you were actually sat with him watching. You sat down. Yeah, we were watching it. I, we were watching it together. Yeah. He yeah. knew exactly what they were doing. He was very upset. Star would tell me stuff. And Gavin, when he'd come over when he was sick, because she never went to the hospital, he, they, they hated the mother. But it was weird how money can change people. Yeah, so according to these statements that were lodged with the court, it reflects that. It says that you said that David was always the one that was at the hospital and that Janet would not go to the hospital. She and, didn't go to the hospital. It was always so David. Just to, in terms of chronologically, I just want to make sh the, the chronology clear. So the reason that you introduced them to Michael was because you were told that Gavin had very severe cancer and, and that they wanted to meet him is that the way it went down he did have cancer yes yeah so but that's that's what led to the introduction of me introducing him yes and i regret that can you just talk about because in your in these statements that were written by the investigator it also talks about you becoming slightly concerned 
as things continued because of what you were witnessing with Janet and the collection of donations. So do you remember that and why you were concerned by it? Well, I started getting concerned because David was telling me stuff and Avalyn, the daughter. She would tell me horrible stuff about her mother, what she would do, and um, just all these horrible stuff about her. I just know that she was a horrible person, and they were out to get Michael. And I, I caught on to it when she mentioned they were going to get a big house in Hollywood Hills. And I said, what do you mean? And she went to say something about Michael, and she shut up. Mm. And that's, I, I believe that's when I called Abby, and I said, get him away from those kids. But then it was months later when they called me and they wanted to know if I knew where those kids were, that Michael wanted them to do this interview with them. And I told them, no, I don't know where they are. And I said, I wouldn't do that. And I think that's where it really got bad. Because oh, once so you Gavilla actually... moved out, well, she moved out a little while after what she said to me, because I started catching on to what was going on. I go, they're going to try to go after him. They're going to make up some stories about him. Yeah, so so you actually advised somebody that they should not put this family in front of the camera for Bashir. No, I told them when I told Evie what they had said, she didn't do anything about it. It was more or less like, well, Michael's a grown man. So when they called me, like, a, it was a while later, they called me maybe three weeks later, so wanting to know where those kids were. And I wouldn't tell them because I was still in touch with David. But I, but I, I trusted Gary, the chauffeur, and I told him. And he went and got those kids. I was furious. I never talked to Evie again. I never talked to Gary. I do see Gary now. I'll talk to him occasionally. But I could never understand that because that's when everything got really bad, when he was on TV and the dad was sitting there and he said, watch what my son's going to do. He's going to lay his head on him. He said, they're getting ready to go after Michael. But she made it look like it was the father doing things. And that, but it was never the father because Devlin would tell me the horrible stuff the mother would do to them, how she'd beat them with hangers and try to run the father over and how, what a horrible person she was that she would go after people. I mean, I was, I was mad at my friend over there. At your son? No, I was mad at my friend Brene for convincing me oh. at the time. Were you around Michael as the trial was happening? Were you doing his hair? Were you involved in... No, well, I wasn't. Time? Karen was there. Karen at that time was running me down and saying horrible stuff. So, but when the trial finishes, Michael goes to the Middle East and does not take Karen and takes you. So uh, you no, know how... let's tell you a story about that one. When okay. they were doing a fundraiser... They reached out to me, and I talked to Michael. I had told him how I told Evie and all them and Gary not to bring those kids around him. Michael never knew this. Nobody ever said nothing to Michael. Well, he was getting tired of Karen because he told me she was talking to the press and trying to put her two cents in, so he fired all of them. I don't know if he let Evie go at that time, but I know Bush, everybody was let go. He only kept Carrie me and grace that's how i ended up in the middle east with him when you say a fundraiser something, i don't know if it was a fundraiser or they decided they were going to do something for michael since the trial was over and all that because remember michael basically if i'm correct didn't he win that case oh yeah of course yeah he was uh, acquitted did you have any contact with any of the arvizos after the trial at all no i was very very upset with them with david i did but them no I was even disappointed with the girl. I couldn't believe she became part of that. And it just bothered me that greed set in. And maybe their thing, when they seen I had a brand new Lexus, maybe they were planning on bringing me, doing something to me. I don't know. Well, actually, the very last line of one of these investigators' statements, it says, The last time Lemire saw David, David admitted that Janet had wanted the children to con her. David would not elaborate, but was upset. Yeah, I think they were going to go after me. I think they thought I was super rich or something. But then they found out I worked for Michael. 
it just it's it was a mess when all went down because I st- I wasn't around for a while. I was very upset with everything. I felt like I was used, and I just felt bad. Michael knew that I had nothing to do with that after when he, we talked and that. So after all that trial and that, I went to the Middle East with him. I would stay out for a minute and come back, but I would carry packages, and I'm sure you read this because Karen did a big thing on it, saying I was his drug dealer. She tried to claim Carrie said this. I didn't know what I was carrying pills. I really didn't. I didn't open his packages. I had carried stuff for him for years, you know, books and stuff. So I just figured, you know, that's what I was carrying. But I found out the hard way I was carrying pills. I'm lucky to be alive. Yeah, so this was in the Middle East? Yes. So but fortunately, they you... really liked me. Yeah, what was I got the caught with them because Michael and me flew to Amman. And all the rulers from different Arab countries. Michael was going to design um, a Disneyland for them. So we flew out there. I'm probably the only woman that ever got to fly with all these men because it's unheard of. But I did fly with them. And I, it had gotten to where I almost had a suitcase filled with stuff. But I just took it with books all the time. I didn't look at his open people's packages. So when we got there... That, he didn't bring Carrie with. And I don't know if he even brought, did the nanny come? No, he didn't bring the kids. They stayed back in Bahrain. And it was me and him and the prince from Bahrain. So when we got there, you know, we all had our place to stay. And all of a sudden I get a call and Carrie's been flown out there. Michael's friend, um, Bill. Remember he was like a dad to Michael? Bill Bray? Bill Bray. Yes, he was like a father to him. He would tell me, I got to go out and get Michael some drawers. <laughs> <laughs> but he died when we were there, and Michael took that really, really, really bad. And that's when I found out what was in the packages. Fortunately, one of them remained in my bag, and I opened it, and I seen what was going on. I get a call that I was to go to Michael's room when they took him out of there because Michael was very, very high. And I was to go in that room and find every pill and flush it. That's what the Middle Eastern people told me. Because they could have just taken me to the desert and killed me. And I went in there. I, I flushed pills for hours, for a couple of hours. And then I went back to my room. When they got back, I guess Michael went to get some and it was they were gone. So he sent Carrie, I think, to the store. And he searched Carrie's room to see if Carrie had him. But I was very upset because I know damn well if I was carrying something and didn't know it, I'm sure Karen carried stuff when she was out there. And I was very, very upset with Michael. All right, Charlie and Carol, let's take our second and final break for a moment to talk about the MJ Cast's shop. Listeners often come to us and ask how they can help support the show. Well, one great thing to do is through purchasing something from our merch store, which is at themjcast.com slash shop, themjcast.com slash shop. And it's here that you'll find amazing, fantastic, unique designs all created by us at the MJCast. From our classic MJCast sunset logo to retro pixel art designs of the Jackson brothers and Michael in all of his opening tour costumes. You'll get fun text-based designs, including all of Michael's solo album names, or adult solo album names, I should say, (laughs) the Captain EO characters, uh, the Jackson brothers. uh, And plus, you can get all of these designs on just about any products you like, from t-shirts to sweatshirts, phone cases, tote bags, mugs, wall art, stickers, and so much more. So be sure to check us out at themjcast.com slash shop. We know that you'll find something that you'll love or something for a loved one. And keep an eye on our page as we plan to release more great designs in the future. All proceeds from our shop sales go to show running costs, equipment and charity donations. For example, we recently donated to help with COVID relief efforts in India. You can promote the MJ cast and Michael Jackson all at the same time, 
with a purchase from the mjcast.com slash shop. And if you do purchase an item, be sure to share that with us. Send us an image to the mjcast at iCloud.com or tag us on social media. And we would absolutely love to share that on our platforms to show you loving the MJ cast and Michael Jackson all at the same time. To listeners of the MJ cast who've bought something from our merch store, thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts for supporting the MJ cast. Let's get back to it. Carol, I, I need to ask, and, and I'd love to hear shortly just why you were upset with Michael. Let's come back to that. But I, I need to ask, I mean, Michael had obviously had many issues with drugs prior to this moment. The Dangerous World Tour was famously cancelled because of his addiction. Um, did you and Kerry, and, and I've spoken to Kerry, and I know how good a guy he is, did you and Kerry at this time feel um, it necessary to intervene and help Michael? Like, how Did you try to help him in any way? Yeah, he didn't, ha- he, didn't ha- he didn't have no pills or nothing. The Middle Eastern people, the prince in them, warned me, don't ever come back here with anything for him. I was very upset because I called back to the States and I talked to Joe, I think it was, that worked at the ranch, and I was furious with them. I said, if you all knew what he had me carrying, I could have been killed. He could have died. He could have OD'd on this stuff because it was all different types of pills, which was very sad because they created this with him, with what he went through with those kids and the first kid. You know, a lot of people, doctors, give people pills and they drown themselves in them to forget, you know, because it just, it was really bad. It was really bad. So had you been in, had you been in Bahrain with Michael before you flew on to Amman? Oh yeah, I was, we were in Bahrain, we were in Dubai, we went to Abu Dhabi once just to visit, then we went to Amman, we went to Muscat. We were there a couple of times. I love that place, but it was real close to the Persian Gulf because I went through some real bad stuff there to where Grace and them tried to pull some shit on me. And this woman he had hired from here, Ramon or something, some things happened with them. I got left there. I was crying, and this man walked up to me, and he said, what's wrong? And I told him, he said, I'll buy you a ticket. And he paid for a first-class ticket for me to get to London. And see, Michael didn't know none of this at the time. So when I got to London, I called um, Joe again at the ranch, and I told him, somebody better do something. I said, because I will talk to the press, but not about Michael. They did this intentionally to me. So this was uh, for the World Music Awards, is that right? No, this was before then. Oh, okay. So I was so upset at the time, I quit. I came back to the States. I didn't want to talk to Michael. And one day he called and I said, please come back. And he didn't know what all I went through. He didn't know. They tried to blame it on Carrie because I think that's when they let Carrie lost his job. They tried to put all this on Carrie, which wasn't true. It wasn't Carrie. It was Grace and this woman, Ramon. So I came back. I, I worked with him again. We went to Ireland and he was recording out there with somebody. And we had a great time there. I stayed in town. I didn't stay with him at the place he was at. I wanted to just be in town. Then we went on, and I came back to the States for a minute, flew back out. We did We did the World Music Awards, and that's when I caught Ramon doing stuff. And it, I think that was her name, Ramon Baines or something. Yeah, so what did, what did you catch her doing? I had a friend fly with me. I paid her ticket, and she had a room. For some reason, they left me back at the hotel. They took my friend, and they put her in the car with the prince, where Michael wanted me to be in the car with this prince. But Michael called me and said, where are you? I said, I'm in my room. He said, why aren't you here? I said, Ramon told me I wasn't to come. He said, what do you mean? I said, they left me here at the hotel. He sent somebody to get me. When I got there, they tried to stop me, but people knew me of working with Michael in London, and I came in. Michael told me to clear them all out. They were all sitting in his one area. Told them um, they all had to leave. I now, enjoyed I'm, that, believe me. <laughs> I'm sure I remember a story that you were assaulted by someone at the World Music Awards, by a security guard or something. I was, because that day, that night, I met people that were flown in for some big party. 
Michael asked me to find out who was throwing this party because they told him he was going to be there. But Michael wasn't going to be there. He knew nothing about it. So what had happened is I met this guy from CNN, a young guy, and he told me, and it was Ray, that Ramon woman throwing this party. It was her collecting all this money. So Michael told me to find out whatever I could. So when I found out, I got in the elevator to come down to where he was staying, where we were in London. And this guard, this Muslim from the States, not from, not from the Middle East, he told me I couldn't go down there. And he started throwing me up against the wall and that. And then Michael heard me and he said, I wanted her here. So I came in, I gave him the card and I told him who was doing this and the stuff they were doing. Now, I had already been paid, too. When I walked into Ramon's room, they had all these money, these pounds on the table. Her and Grace, I don't think Grace was part of it. I don't know. So um, she writes me this check. I said, no, I'm owed way more money than that. And you know what she said to me? Get it from Micah. We gave him some money. And I was so upset. The hotel told me they would get me to the airport. They hated those people. They were doing things like not letting anybody go out. I went out and took stuff they wanted to be given to Michael, and they wouldn't let it be given to Michael. They were, She was doing horrible stuff, this woman. That's when I quit. That's when I quit. I told Michael, when you get rid of these people, I will work for you again. But until then, I will not work for you. I love you, but I can't do this. That man threw me... In that elevator, he was slamming me up against walls, everything. When I got back in, he did it again. He did a number to me. I was scared because he told me he would get me to the airport. But I was like, I talked to the hotel. They said, no, we'll get you to the airport. They hated those people. So that was the last time I worked with Michael. And then two weeks before he died, he called me and he said, Cal, I said, what? He said, you know, it's okay, pills are legal. I said to Michael, excuse my language, because I could talk to him like this. I said, fuck you. <laughs> I was so mad. He didn't know what I had went through. I said, Michael, it is not okay to take pills just because the doctor prescribes them. And then he said, Errol, he said, did I show you a good time when we traveled? And then I said, yes, you did. He said, but first class, right? I said, yes, you did. I talked to him for quite a while. And he wanted me to come see him, but I I couldn't at the time. I knew he was back on drugs because I seen him on TV when they were announcing it. I could see he was doing drugs again. He told me how much he cared for me and that. But I I couldn't go back to work. And how long was this before he passed away? He passed away two weeks later. That's why I didn't go to none of the stuff. I heard Karen was sitting on top of a coffin or something, having people taking pictures of her. So, you know that comment that he made, didn't I show you a good time and first class and all that stuff? What did you make of that at the time? What did you think he was getting at there? He he did, because everywhere I stayed, it was first class. I stayed in hotels with him that I could never afford to. He never made me pay my phone bills. One time I flew out at the last minute on one of the shows and I wore his clothes because we were like the same size. So there, he, did, he was very good to me, very good to me. But what do you think he meant? Do you think that he was sort of trying to say, you owe me? Or what, what do you think was the intent behind that comment? He was just telling me, did he? and he did. He wasn't trying to get me to give me. He did it first when he called, but then he, when I said what I said to him, he left that be. So, no, yeah, he, he, um, he would never be like that. I know him too well. What was your impression of his mood or his mental state, you know, those two weeks before his death? He, he before that, when, when I quit, he told me he would never do a show again. He had told me that he would never do a show again. So what was he, did he say anything to so you? I was that, surprised out? when... They announced that, but when I seen him on TV, I knew he was high. I knew the pills were in him. But, you know, that's an, that's an illness. That's an addiction. It's a terrible illness. Oh, you know, it's too bad his family couldn't have stepped in and got him away from this. But 
people made sure that couldn't happen. They did everything during, they could to keep him away from his family. But during that phone call, did he make any comment about that he did or did not want to do the shows, or how did he seem? Talking to him, he wouldn't have did the shows. I'll tell anybody that. He wouldn't have did the shows. I know he wouldn't have. He wasn't capable of it. Mm. And he had told me that when we were in London, he, he would never do a show again. He was very upset in London because when we did that show, he thought him and Chris were going to work together. He didn't know they had those kids. He was very, very upset because he didn't want to go on stage. He did not want to get on that stage when he found that he was going to go out there with a bunch of kids. He was very, very upset. He did not, that wasn't planned because he wanted to do, and it was funny because he said to me, he, that was why he said they didn't want him to rehearse with Beyonce and Chris because he thought he was going to sing with them. And the whole thing was changed, but he was very, very upset about those kids. He said because people would just make up. He was very upset. I can guarantee you that. If you watch that clip, he doesn't come right out because I was backstage with him. Doesn't come right out. He didn't want to go out. Yeah, it, it definitely. I was in the audience that night, and it it almost felt like he wasn't going to come out because it was so far into the song by the time he appeared. He wasn't. Was... He was very upset because he had always told me if he went if he went on the road again. If he ever did something, he used to tell me he wanted to work with Chris Brown. It wasn't Gaga. I don't know where that came from. It was Chris Brown, but it was just kind of sad. Do you have any idea what what his vision was for that performance in 2006? What he was planning to do with Chris and Beyonce? I think dance and sing, because he did not know those kids were going to be there. I don't know if Ramon fixed that or who did that with him, but... There was no rehearsal with them. I can honestly tell you that. So he was very, very upset. If we can, I just want to jump back a bit to the um, the Middle East because you mentioned all these places that you went to with Michael during that period. Now, obviously, the Bill Bray incident seems to have triggered a bit of a meltdown for him. But how had he been prior to that because obviously he's if you're carrying around this case then this case is full of pills it's just that he's taken them because bill bray has passed away but you the pills are already in the case so had you any inkling that he was using them up prior to that point i don't know i can't say i don't know i know um when we got there he liked the fact that i was bringing kids and he could um sign pictures and that because normally they wouldn't let him do that but see, Ramon wasn't there, and I don't know how she made herself his manager. But um, he really enjoyed that because I had kids, people from the Middle East that got autographs from him, and he really liked that. But then, like I said, that night, Bill Bray died, and they flew Carrie. They had Carrie come from Bahrain. Because I asked yeah. Carrie at the time if he had said that about He said, would I do that? Because I'm friends with Carrie. When you first got there, when you first met up with Michael after the trial, how was he then? He was very leery about a lot of things, being accused of stuff. Um, I remember when I came to Ireland, he was very upset about stuff. I think he was very hurt. He was very hurt that people would think this of him. Hmm. I mean, wouldn't anybody be hurt if you got accused of something you didn't do? And are you saying also that maybe he was he was frightened of being accused again? Yeah, he didn't want to be on stage. He did not know those kids were going to be on stage. I can honestly tell you that. He thought he, we, in fact, there was a time he was set up for a rehearsal with Chris and Beyonce, and all some for some reason it got canceled. And that's probably why it got canceled because they were bringing those kids in. And it's funny you noticed that. Now, was that the one Rian, Riani was out to Rian, or was that another one? Yeah, and uh, the, the, the audience actually thought, when, at the point that Rihanna came out, the audience thought that that was going to be Michael. Um, and then when she appeared on stage, she actually got booed um, for no reason other than that she was not Michael. And it seemed like pretty much the whole audience at that award ceremony, the whole ticket buying audience was just Michael Jackson fans. And of course, the show went on and on with no appearance by Michael. And um, 
he popped up very briefly to collect his award and then they started setting the stage up for a performance and everybody was going oh this is it this is going to be michael's performance and then rihanna came out and the place just it just erupted with booze it was really awkward and so i didn't i was with him so i didn't see that i was in his room with him did he meet rihanna then but how did you i didn't see her come in i seen beyonce he had her come in and um kabali she stopped him he wanted because he made those clothes because michael's clothes all disappeared and he had made clothes from is it robert cavalli the designer Roberto yeah cavalli yeah because i remember michael threw the jacket into the audience if i'm correct mm-hmm. yeah so he um he was upset about that that they were stopping people that he would have liked to have talked to she they became people where they thought they could control him this woman she wasn't his manager i don't know how she took that because when i got back to the states i called carrie and he brought Randy and I met them because she had was signed the check with her name. It wasn't Michael's name. She signed the check. She had taken over everything. Which so I thought in, was really, really strange. From your perspective, you know, being on the inside at that time, why do you think there was an effort to stop people like Roberto Cavalli and, and you getting to Michael? Because what, what is the point? I don't know. Yeah. Okay. I can honestly tell you, though, it was one of the happiest I ever seen him when he was in the Middle East. Well, I want to explore that a little bit more. I never seen him so happy. Yeah, we talked about some of the challenging things that happened in the Middle East, but talk to us about some of the fun times. What was Michael getting up to in these countries? Oh, he loved it. I remember one night he told me he went with the prince and they had dancers. <laughs> they had belly dancers and that. And I remember I would go to the black markets and come back with jewelry. He goes, how did you get that? I said, I went into the black market. He said, were you afraid? I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> One time I got scared, though, but it was just, he like I had never seen him so relaxed, to be honest. He was very relaxed, but I think something happened where all of a sudden he was angry with Grace for some reason. I don't know what she did. But I think she was great for his kids and that. But he was mad at her about something. I don't know if there was a rumor saying he was supposed to marry her or something. But he was very mad. And I told him, don't be mad at her. He goes, she takes good care of your kids. Mm. But I heard she used to get a little upset when she heard I was coming. Because Carrie said, whenever I came somewhere, he was always excited. Because Carrie, I think, was let go when we were in the Middle East. They did something. They talked about him. Yeah. During this whole period of time in the Middle East and then also later on in Ireland, I mean, Michael was working sporadically on music. Did you yeah. did you get to talk to him about the music that he was working on? No, no. I always stayed out of that. But he, I never seen him more relaxed than when he was in the Middle East. I remember, too, when we, were, we went to London, we went to a museum. Was it a museum? No, we went, we were going somewhere. And the we had the guards from the Middle East, and it was a trip because they didn't know how to guard him, and the fans broke the wall down. I had to take over. <laughs> I guess I slung the whole case. I had a makeup kit he had me get. I slung that. It landed on the prince's foot. <laughs> Michael had to jump on top of a car. I was pushing people away, and I think they called me the handler. <laughs> <laughs> And that because there was nobody to protect him. Was that at the recording studio in 2005? It was, I think, a studio or somewhere we were going where they found out. And I can tell you what happened there because my my friend was there. It was Raymond came down and told all the fans where Michael was going for some reason. Uh, well, I think I think as a promotional stunt because then there was somebody in the corner with a video camera who filmed it and sent it to the media. So the story was, you know, Michael Jackson gets mobbed by fans in London. So I think that the whole thing was a setup by Ramon. No, uh, he, went there, he was too scared. No, well, I'm not saying that Michael knew about it, but I'm telling you that my friend was there when Ramon came down and told all the fans outside the hotel to go to the studio. Because Michael, I remember the pictures of Michael climbing up on top of the car to, um, to protect himself. I don't really, I don't, he didn't seem like he knew that was going to happen because he was scared. Because I'm sure 
you know that that whole wall, that whatever it was, they broke that down and came running in there. And it wasn't, um, it was Middle Eastern guards, and they weren't violent people. That was very, very scary for him. Uh, I would like to ask you about another family that Michael became quite close to that ended up sort of taking advantage of him a lot later after he died. But how much do you know about the Cassio family? Were they a family where there was a girl and a boy? Uh, There's Frank and Eddie Cassio, two boys. There's also a girl. They sort of spent a lot of time with Michael through the 90s, traveling with him on tour. I just wanted to know if you knew much about that family and their interactions Most with Most of them Michael. were always okay families. I meant there was one family, there was a boy and a girl, I believe, but they all seemed okay. Wade always seemed okay. I could yeah. never figure out what made Wade. Was it money because he he wasn't getting getting jobs any longer? I never seen him do anything with Wade, anything inappropriate. Mm. Was Wade around a lot? Did you see them together a lot? Wade was at the ranch for a minute when they came here because then the father went back to his country. No, Michael started, as he got older, Michael got him jobs. He became one of your biggest choreographers. So I, I, I've heard different stories and, you know, things can be rumors that Wade messed up his own career because you never mess with your clients. I don't care who you work with. You do not date your clients. And that's all. I, I don't know what happened with Wade. I know Michael really liked Wade. Yeah, sorry. So we we got as far as the phone call. So you get the phone call from Michael a few weeks before he passes away. Could you just talk us through how you found out that Michael had passed away and the aftermath from your perspective? I got called up. I was in London at the time with uh, my granddaughter. And I got called up, I think it was from one of the three T and told me he had passed away because I was, it really was upsetting to me. I didn't, I wouldn't go to none of the stuff. There's no way. You, like the funerals? The funeral, the, they have some kind of big thing. I think it's stables or something. That, I don't think he would have liked that. He wouldn't have liked his kids being interviewed. He wouldn't have liked any of that. Like when you've seen Paris on TV crying when she said, I love you, daddy, or something. She, he wouldn't have liked that. He, I remember once when, I was at one of the places off of, I think it was Coldwater Bendick, this big, huge house. And I remember I went over there and cooked for him. And when we were eating dinner, I remember how Paris got up and walked up to him when she was through and looked at him and hugged him and said, I love you, Daddy. And I and Blanket at that time was trying to reach into my stuff. <laughs> I just, his kids were just so well-behaved and so well they were extremely smart. What was Michael like as a father? A wonderful father. He didn't let his kids eat a bunch of candy and cookies and stuff. He only let other people's kids. <laughs> he was a very good father. I don't think there could be a better father. I remember when we did a magazine cover, I think it was for some older magazine from years ago, and I remember it was with Prince as a baby, but he was an amazing father. He loved being a father. How did you personally cope with Michael's passing? So you did not go to the funerals. So how oh, did you I'm, come I still to get very upset over it. It still bothers me. I, I wish I wish doctors had been like they have to be now because they have to keep a record of anything they give a client. They can't just give people pills like they used to. You know, I wish back then it was like that. And I, I don't know why this doctor would put him to sleep with something that they do when you're having surgeries. I don't understand that. You know, a doctor shouldn't have never did that. Can I just uh, just jump back slightly? Sorry. When you, when you were talking about that last phone call with Michael, you said that from talking to him, you know that he wouldn't have done the shows and he was not capable. What was it about that phone call that left you with the impression that he was not capable of doing those shows. He had told me months before when we were in the Middle East, he would never, he didn't want to ever do a show again. He had told me that. After the Leonard thing, he had told me he never wanted to do a show again. He called me numerous times when I, I didn't want to be there any longer. So when he got rid of those people, call me. But when I seen him on TV, 
he wasn't capable of doing that. So why were you worried? I could see he was stoned. I could see he was very high. I could see it when I was walking, looking in his mouth and that. I don't know if he would have really brought Karen back. I was surprised that he did, but I guess he had no choice. Did he um, ever tell you why he did not want to ever do a show again? No, I think over those accusations, I think it just destroyed him um, mentally. I think he became more of a person that just took pills all the time. I think I even told somebody in his family once that if they didn't get him away from all, he would be dead. I can't remember who I said that to, but I really worried about him. I was flattered when he asked me to take care of the three D to do their hair and all that. Did you ever confront Michael as a friend and say, Michael, you shouldn't be doing these things when you discovered he was taking so many pills? I didn't, to be honest, I didn't realize that till all those pills that I was carrying over there, not knowing there were pills that he had a really bad drug problem. I knew he took pills, but I didn't know it was that bad. Mm. You know, because he was very good at stepping out in that stage. Uh, I see. I just think all that caused that. I don't think it was so much being burned. I think that did some of it, but I think the accusations destroyed him. I couldn't imagine him ever touching anybody's kid. Well, I think the proximity of your own son is a testament to that, because if you had any... Any, you know, even if you had a 1% suspicion, then you would not be allowing your son and your grandson to be around him, presumably. So you must have trusted him absolutely implicitly. It was my granddaughter and son. Yeah, because um, yeah, I never seen him do anything inappropriate. And my, Clay was always there. Nico was always there. I traveled with him. I brought him everywhere I went. He threw him that party every year. He had a big, huge birthday party. Probably the best birthday party anybody could ever have. They had all the rides, and they would barbecue. They just, he went all out for Clay, and I thought that was so nice of him because he didn't have to do that, but that was every year he did that. And there were times when um, we would bring some cars, and we'd stay over three for three and four days and hang out because he used to always let me use the ranch. I was privileged, I guess. (laughs) Yeah. I really miss him, though. I really miss him. I gave up a lot of jobs to work with him. It just has never been the same. I don't even fly any longer. I get off of jobs, and I don't want them. I don't want to fly. Why not? I just don't want to. I flew so much and flying in and out of the Middle East and coming back here for two days and getting back on a plane again and... A lot of things can happen when you're on planes that scare you. And I mean, I was treated great. You know, when I hit the Middle East, I was a VIP. Everything was great for me. I just, um, ever since him, I don't go on the road with anybody. You said that you still get upset today about Michael's passing. What what are the kind of things that set you off, that trigger you, that reaction? The you? stories people make up about him and... That's such lies and just a lot of things that people do and just how how he would do things for people, but he didn't want press to know. He was always helping people. He was always helping people. He would give people his last stamp. That's the kind of person he was. There's nothing he wouldn't do for somebody. I mean, there's not a lot of people like him. He was probably one of the most caring people you could ever meet. He was good with me even though I quit many times and I got fired and I came back. and Towards the end, you know, we really got to know each other. And I think I'm not the only one that used to have problems with that one person. I think everybody did. Yeah, well, you're you're not the first person to mention it to us in an interview. (laughs) That's for sure. No, she wasn't nice. And I was glad when he caught on to it. Carol, just as we start wrapping up there's a a couple of questions still left to ask that i'd I'd like to but are there any particular memories that you had with michael any moments that we haven't covered that you'd like to mention any fun stories or anything like that well like when he'd call me up in the middle of the night and i'd be sitting down in a garage in his hideout and he would never um i ended up laying there all night till i would wake up his assistant and say look he's not let me in. I'm going home now. 
<laughs> oh my goodness. And he would just think that was so funny. <laughs> and and I would I don't want to name which star it was, but there was somebody that would call him all the time and go, Pretend you're me. <laughs> and I would talk to the person because I could at that time imitate his voice to a T. And just stupid stuff we did. <laughs> you know, cranking people getting in that big Bronco and driving around and throwing eggs and stuff at people. <laughs> that is great. I had a lot of fun with him. He was just, he was a big kid and he would bring the kid out and anybody that worked with him. And I missed a lot of the first people. So Carol, in your opinion, how do you think Michael Jackson should be remembered? As this wonderful entertainer, because when, when we did shows like in, Europe, I don't know if you ever went to one in France, Paris. The audience would go so crazy. People were getting suffocated. And the more that happened, he got more and more excited on that stage. I mean, there were people that would jump up on the VIP box and piss pee on, down on us. And when I would tell him that, he just thought that was so funny. <laughs> but just watching the excitement of the crowd, just to see how much people loved him. It was just amazing, and I can see why, because I don't think I met a nicer person than him. You know, there was nothing he wouldn't do for me if I needed something. Beautiful answer. And, and as we know, your, your dear friend Taj, Michael's nephew, is, is now hard at work putting together a, a documentary series that is going to really explore the truth of Michael as a, as a person. So how important do you think it is to the world that that comes to light? Very important, very important, because he was not the person that some of these people try to say he is. He was never that kind of person. Uh, if if anything, if he was that kind of person, why didn't Macaulay Calkin say something about him? Mm. That was his favorite person, him and Emmanuel. Yeah, Emmanuel Lewis. Any of them will tell you. They'll probably tell you the same stories I can tell you. I remember him and... The kid, they would put buckets above the door in the suits. I would call them the suits. Like when we did something with MTV. Because I worked on a lot of stuff like that. He didn't use Karen. I worked on the Oprah Winfrey thing with him. And I don't think she was there at that. Actually, that was my lipstick. He thought he was being funny because I always wear red lipstick. And give me that lipstick. I said, you can't wear I'm putting it on. And he did. <laughs> It was just the funny things he could do with people that would just crack you up. And to the laughter. I don't know if you ever heard him laugh, but I don't think there's a laugh like his in this world. I can't even describe how great his laugh was. It was just so funny. He had this laugh where it just came from way inside his stomach. He would just laugh and laugh. And a lot of people, I'm lucky that I got to see that side of him. You know, and I got to hear his stories when he was in the Middle East, how they would, um, he would sit with the prince and they would have girls dancing for them and just things he really, really enjoyed. It's just sad that, you know, he's gone. But I don't think there'll ever be a bigger star than him. And I'll always remember my first day of meeting him. I guess I should have felt flattered. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that he slammed the door in my face. <laughs> And just watching him creep through the yard behind the bushes. There's just he, Anybody that really knew him would tell you the same things I tell you about him. I know Todd could tell you so much because I know he really favored Todd. Uh, there was a question I didn't ask you earlier, but I was thinking about it. And when Dee Dee Jackson passed away and Michael you know, became even more involved with his nephews, did you see Michael nurturing them? Well, I used to see them at the ranch many times when they were before she even passed away as little kids. Mm. I would see them out there. I think he always kind of favored them. That was them and then these two other kids that were cousins. But I think he always favored those three. I mean, I was flattered when he asked me would I work with them. I had never barbered before. I went and took classes to learn. And I think I did a great job. <laughs> I had fun with them. I had a lot of fun with those three kids. And how, how often do you see them and, and the Jackson family members now? Do you still sort of catch up? On I don't see them a lot. I, I reached out to Todd recently because I wanted him to come and help me do this, but they just had their new baby. 
So I'm going to reach out to them, hope maybe I can meet them and see the baby. Great. And that, but I know they have a new baby again. <laughs> and I, I enjoy watching TJ and Terrell, especially TJ, the kind of dad he is. Mm. He has his own little show he does. And watching how much he loves his woman, it's just, it's amazing. I always call them my boys. They're my boys. So have you talked to TJ or Terrell? Yeah, I was just going to say we've actually had the pleasure of interviewing all three of them at this point, and um, you're you're absolutely right. TJ as a father is is just an incredible thing to watch, and he told us some great stories about how he used to talk to Michael uh, about being a father and fatherhood, and towards the end of Michael's life, that's when they really connected about fatherhood. Yeah, and I think he was the right choice to help with the kids. Mm. I think Prince, following him, is an amazing person. I'm just blown away with how generous and the stuff Prince does. I think Blanket, I never got to really know them as they got older. But Blanket, I think he's more like Michael than anybody. He's probably very shy. I remember him as a baby. And Paris, I think this was very hard for her. I would have never had people interviewing her. He wouldn't have liked that. I know he wouldn't have. But he'd be so proud of Prince if he was alive, you know, just watching what Prince does. When you think back about Michael and the good times, is there one memory that you always go to? I think when we rode around and threw eggs at people in their cars. I think about that a lot. I mean, you know, most people didn't know that side of him. He was a jokester. There was a lot of silly things, like tucking somebody's dress inside their underwear, putting toilet paper in my pants, and I'm walking around with a string of toilet paper, chocolate on his underwear. Did people realize it was Michael Jackson who just egged their car? No. (laughs) No. They could have kept the egg and sold it. (laughs) <laughs> you know what was really nice, too? He always had all these toys. And one day he said to my son, he said, take whatever you want. My son took two toys, two toys. He wanted him to take them all. <laughs> and he still got one of them. He's got a pirate doll that Michael had, and he's got a baseball that Michael signed to him. He had a hat that he took off his head. When my daughter got real sick, I let this guy auction a lot of my stuff, which I I hated I had to do that, but sometimes Michael would have been there for me to do that. You know, I had Karen saying horrible stuff about that, but she don't know why I did that. My daughter's very ill. Mm. You know, I have a lot of fans reach out and ask me, do I have stuff? And I, I have things I know people would love to have, like his, his dryer. I definitely have his dryer, his steamer. I, I, um, my son was very upset that I did get do that with the hat, which I probably shouldn't have. I've always kept a hair piece, one hair piece that I always liked. I, to be honest, I never told him, but I used to give his hair pieces. I didn't tell the woman whose hair pieces they were, but I would give them to her to get put on little Richard's head. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that funny? No, he never knew he was wearing Michael's hair pieces. Oh my God, that's an exclusive. I've got a I got a, a, a last question for you about um like we we know of Michael as fans as this absolute superstar and we we see him in all this concert footage and and incredible things like that but when you knew Michael the the regular guy at home <laughs> you know what sort of what was he like as a regular person did he did he what sort of food did he like to eat that kind of thing he would pretend he was a health nut but Michael's thing was chicken wings Cheerios. Let me think, because I would bring Cheerios to him. I came over and fried chicken wings for him at one of his places. Right. He loved chicken wings, loved chicken wings. I think that was one of his favorite things is chicken wings, and he loved Cheerios. Yeah, there's a lot of stories out there of Michael wanting to go on KFC runs. (laughs) Yeah, he loved chicken wings. When I cooked them, he loved them. (laughs) Because I would go up to the one house when he stayed at this one place he rented. It was on top of a hill, and it was huge. It had a glass floor, and there was a bowling alley underneath it and a swimming pool where the dining table was. And I, um, I brought Renee with me, and I made him fried chicken wings, macaroni and cheese. We, we did a number, but he loved chicken wings. 
He would never turn down a wing. <laughs> and his cooks, like Sadna, I don't know if you've ever talked to Kasha or Sadna, but they're really great people, especially Kasha, because she has a restaurant over here by me. And she probably has some great stories. Well, we we actually, they're the people that you you are the kind of people we, we love to interview, people that knew Michael Jackson on that sort of um, professional level, friendship level, but not necessarily in the studio or, you know, on the on stage. We, we, talk, we love talking to those people. But. No, Kasha cooked. She would bake. Kasha, we really liked Kasha and Sudna. They were married. They were Sikhs at the time. He was yeah. Italian and she was Jewish. And they cooked for him, but when they split, he kept Sudna, and Sudna went on the road with us. And then there was Wayne from years ago. He, we used to call him Dark Gable. Okay. Those are people that really knew Michael. Yeah. I don't know if they're still around because they, you know, they they were older. There were two older guys, and they're both gone now. One was um, Lee Salters, and then I can't remember the guy's name, but they were like his publicist people, and they were just so funny when they show up on a set. They both have these their little light knee socks on. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I used to have fun with Michael because he would make fun of people. They didn't know it, but <laughs> it was just fun. He was the funnest person you could ever work for. Great. But I know Tatum O'Neill was his biggest crush because he used to tell me that. <laughs> All right, Charlie, are you good to wrap? Uh, yeah. So thank you very much, Carol. Thank you for joining us. It's been a, a privilege and a pleasure and uh, great fun to have you on the show. I'm not sure I've ever laughed so much during a an MJ cast interview. So thank you for your insights and for being so entertaining. Well, thanks for having me. <laughs> I guess I am entertaining sometimes. That's what people tell me. Very much so. <laughs> and I enjoy talking to you because I love him to no end. And so do we. Thank you so much, Carol. It's it's always a, a okay. pleasure to speak to people who knew Michael so closely, and we're very, very lucky to have spoken to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you for having me. Okay. It's nice <laughs> talking to you guys. Okay, well, there we go, Charlie. What an episode. Oh, my God. That was some blockbuster stuff right there. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm surprised that she told as much as, as what she did on the record. Well, it's those kind of stories we love to hear and provide for our listeners. Charlie, thank you for being here again. And to all of our listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. Join us next time on the MJ Cast. Keep Michaeling.